going. Okay, I think we're good. Well, welcome everybody. Today I have the huge pleasure to chat with a woman I've been following for quite a while now, Jane Clapp. And Jane is a feminist embodied resilience and trauma recovery coach. And I first got really interested in her work because I saw that she was kind of bridging the gap between what I thought of as trauma-informed practice and then also some of what we might think of as like movement culture and strength work. And so as I've been following her posts now, I see that she really does like a wonderful job weaving together what at first glance might be very disparate fields. And so I'm really excited to talk with her and get a better understanding of how she weaves these threads together and really just to see what other kind of nuggets she can bring our way. So Jane, I'm super excited to talk with you. Thanks for Me being too. here. Me too. I'm really excited to talk to you as well. I'm excited about your work as well. Cool. So <laughs> what's going on in your world? What are you most excited about at this point? Um, well, I mean, I love my, all, my work. I love my work with my individual clients because it's such a, um, a place to experiment and learn through other people's bodies. Um, but some of the work that I brought in this last year has really come from a really deep personal place for me. <clears throat> which was um, coming back to creative expression and play and movement. And mm -hmm. I've always tried to bring some of that in the work that I've done, especially over the last few years. Um, uh, but I have I took a clowning uh, Legio class with a fellow named John Beale in Toronto. And as I'm like in the the first half of the first day, I was like, my mind was kind of blown by how it was so possible to decouple like nervous system activation from stress and anxiety through mm -hmm. play and through connecting with other people. And um, I knew it so intuitively, but I just don't feel like that is something that's been done really well in the movement world quite yet. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I'm most excited about is how that's impacted the way I teach a two day or three day trauma training and mm -hmm. how that impacts my body and my nervous system and uh, also starting to roll it out and offering. So I'm co-facilitating a uh, clowning Lojou class with, he calls it a presence class. So mm -hmm. it's basically how to be very present um, and vulnerable and how that really shows up in the way that we connect with other people and other people's bodies, right? <laughs> and, yeah. and how that activates what's called the social engagement system. So um, what I think is great. And I even scheduled, a, it's called the sweaty day of play in August in Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> and I went on to this amazing website that has tools for kids who are living with um, some motor challenges, and for older, like aging adults that, uh, that work on cognitive development. And I got into this website and I'm like, oh my God, this is all so brilliant. Why aren't we using this as, as quote, healthy moving adults as well? And how can we start looking at um, the way we move our bodies and even become stronger with the lens of like reorient, reorienting to pleasure, as mm -hmm. Dr. Peter Levine calls it as essential for, for any human's kind of full capacity to live and engage in relationship. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a lot to, to dig into there. Okay. So I'm, I'm so curious because a lot of people listening might not be as familiar with some of the, let's say trauma informed work as, as you and I are. And so I'm, mm. I'm wondering, like what are some of the things that come up in a person's life that makes them look for someone like you and look for work like this? I mean, how do they, how does this first come to someone's awareness? That's a great question. Um, because it, people used to think there's like this small group of people who experience trauma over there. And um, we would look at training and being trauma informed as something we would do for a niche population. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that we just want to cover our bases, which um, isn't true, because when any one of us, when our resources for dealing with stress um, be outweigh the actual stressor, mm -hmm. life event, um, whatever that life event could be is very broad. 
when we get into that state of feeling like our internal and external resources um, don't match the level of stress that we're facing, all of us experience um, the same neurobiological impact of that. Mm -hmm. And so when we become overwhelmed, um, the way that our brain works and the kind of information that we pay, we prioritize and pay attention to is all very similar. Um, so for me, when I think of trauma informed, it's not about keeping people safer and doing more harm. It goes deeper into understanding the complex, the complexities of our neurobiology when we get into a state of feeling overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And that, so people come to me when they feel overwhelmed, right? So people yeah, come to yeah. me when they're like, this is a really difficult life situation I'm currently facing, or I bring all of this life experience, maybe from childhood, that has me feeling like my cup is already full mm -hmm. and potentially overflowing. And so my work is, okay, how can we make your cup feel bigger so you yeah. don't feel like you're overflowing and you feel more resourced? So you have as much skill, um, creative resources to deal with whatever you're feeling either in your body through chronic pain um, or through any kind of critical illness or through violence, interpersonal violence. How can we make you feel like you're back to I've got this? Mm -hmm. Because when we feel in our brains and our bodies like we've got this, the way we move changes. Mm -hmm. the, our ability to engage and connect with other people through the social engagement system in our nervous system comes back online. Mm -hmm. um, our motor reflexes improve. We feel like we want to go and look for experiences that make us feel more alive. So people come to me because they want to get back to living. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I've yeah. always thought about that, that idea of kind of like the stress bucket or stress cup. It's like, it might be full to burst. And then you throw in like, high intensity movement practice kind of stuff. And it's like, it's a good quote stress. And yet that could kind of push you over the edge too, right? If you're not working in, in you got like an informed way, I guess. I call it like, I work with um, what trauma uh, recovery therapists call the window of tolerance for stress. Mm. Um, Many people use it. Pat Ogden, who created sensory motor psychotherapy, uses it. Mm -hmm. So I'm always like, if you're going to have a really intense physiological um, experience with exercise or movement, mm -hmm. how can you track your body to know that it's adaptive stress versus malstress? And uh. how can, right? So how do you know that you're in a use stress state? And you're working with your autonomic nervous system in a way that allows you to integrate? the work mm -hmm. and not further dysregulate your chronic stress state and how do you track that and the biggest thing for me is like if you can't breathe through your nose when you're doing high intensity interval training mm. chances are you've moved into a state of mouth stress oh, okay interesting mm -hmm. <laughs> huh are there other i'm so curious now are there other kind of like physiological hints that you might get that things have switched into a not so great kind of territory yeah like i i i uh ride a horse and i've learned so much about how to be doing something extremely difficult scary like jumping over something mm -hmm. on a big giant amazing creature that's giving me permission <laughs> he's giving me permission to boss him around right Mm -hmm. But my coach, my coach tells me, slow your body down, slow your body down. So I'm in a very assertive, powerful carriage. Mm -hmm. um, but there's part of me that always remains like, like a very calm warrior. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. I'm like, I've got this because when I get out of that state, the horse starts getting agitated. So I get this like amazing feedback loop. So I'm always like, if you start to get into a panic state and mm -hmm. you're just in this state of, I absolutely can't wait to be done with whatever I'm doing right in this moment, you've probably left your body. You're mm -hmm. probably not tuning into inner body sensation. Mm 
-hmm. And you're, if you live with any level of hyper arousal in your nervous system, that's sort of hyper vigilant, mm -hmm. then you're just patterning those neural pathways in even more. But yeah. if you add play, if you add play and laughter or a connection with other people as you're challenging yourself that way, it, often takes down that sort of hyper arousal that can happen right gotcha yeah yeah so is that where i mean where you see something like the the clowning arts work that you started exploring is that where some of that ties in just in terms of getting that social engagement in the practice going yeah well oh. um it's funny i i used to perform in my 20s and i did a lot of physical comedy Oh, okay. And um, and it was stressful. But there was this moment where I felt like people in the room were re really with me. Mm. And that's something you feel in your body. Like mm -hmm. you just feel this connection and safety. Right? Yeah. So what I found what was so great to re-experience many years later was when we were doing games, like we were playing tag. Um, but we were laughing. And we were all connected. And we were... It was competitive, but it was a, a really playful competitiveness. Yeah. We were sweating, and I was like, oh, my God, we all stink, and we're all sweaty. <laughs> but I looked around the entire room, and everybody's face, you could tell that their ventral vagal system was online. Hmm. And, and um, the social engagement system was online because the fa our, everyone's facial muscles were looking ready for connection. So there wasn't any real fear so i'm doing we're doing these like tag games and other higher intensity somewhat stressful games mm -hmm. but everybody was like was ready to play and um oh that's awesome and so i went to john after i'm like this is brilliant this is like post-traumatic growth this is stuff that we have missed in the movement community because i mean i've been coaching for so many years and i mm -hmm. and i started out in such a prescriptive way especially because my earlier coaching days were so much about fat loss and prescription and mm -hmm. bo body composition training. And I was doing a lot more like polyquin type stuff. And, um, and it wasn't fun for people and it was really hard for people to stick with it because yeah. they weren't, they weren't experiencing joy in their mm -hmm. bodies. Mm -hmm. And I feel like culturally speaking, one of the reasons that uh, depression is the leading cause of time off work worldwide, according to the World Health Organization, mm -hmm. is because culturally we've lost our orientation to play, to hobbies, to expression, to living in community, um, mm -hmm. playing music together, all the things that have kept us connected to one another. And so much of movement has, has been so prescriptive and and utilitarian and yeah and i'm just like okay like you can squat perfectly but tell me is there any part of you that is enjoying what you're doing right now mm, that's big yeah <laughs> right i've been thinking about that so much more lately where it's like damn i don't care about the tricks and I'll, like there was a period of my life where i was very trick focused i was like i want this perfect handstand and i want da, 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 because someone somewhere told me i should want that and <laughs> it's just it's a chore and you know at some point in the past couple of years especially in like the past year it's like a switch flipped and it's like oh yeah now i just want to do things that are actually fun to be doing mm. like i'll just go walk around the trails out here and it's like Oh, do I want to climb on that? Do I want to jump on that? Like, here's this big ass log. Can I get it overhead just for fun and just to see like what's, what's possible, but it's, yeah. you know, it's not a quantitative practice by any means. And I know that probably drives some people absolutely insane. Like yeah. we've got this societal compulsion for numbers and outcomes and da, 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 da. And, and growth. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, Which, as like a linear phenomenon, always. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like I look at, I do a lecture in one of my webinars on the obsession with self-improvement and how that is mm. often just a, an expression of hypervigilance in our nervous system. Like if I mm. actually don't stop trying really hard, something bad's going to happen. Oh, that's really interesting. 
right? Um, and it's not to say, like, I think one of the things you said was great, that you wanted to master a handstand, you wanted to do this perfectly. That stuff is valid, like, mm -hmm. because mastering something is very mindful. You're very present in the moment, which is powerful. But it's amazing to me how we haven't been taught to celebrate those small victories. And instead of them being a passing experience, actually savor those little small victories and those, those moments of mastery and really install them in our nervous system mm -hmm. so that they become something that we really carry with us. Because people who have felt really overwhelmed, people who come out of the trauma history, um, really need to feel moments of victory in their body. Mm -hmm. um, so that you have this state of I felt helpless at one point in my life and disempowered or frozen or collapsed as what happens in the autonomic nervous system during traumatic stress. And then you're like, and here's this victory, but we don't take those moments in and truly celebrate them, right? Mm, yeah. And, and that's the reorienting to pleasure, right? To enjoyment, to victory, to joy. We, we, uh, and I think honestly, I think it's just an expression of a bit of the puritanical work ethic that's, um, expressed through capitalism, mm. um, in some yeah. ways. And not that there's anything wrong with it. capitalism. It's just, it weaves into the way we relate to our bodies as well. Huh. <laughs> okay. That's super juicy. I, could you <laughs> tell me a bit more about that? Yeah. Um, well, Gabor Mate is pretty awesome. I don't know if you follow Dr. Gabor, Ma Gabor bit, Mate. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I'm not sure if he has a book out, but he's threatened to write this book about how capitalism uh, in its purest uh, expression actually mm -hmm. makes a lot of people sick. Huh. Because we treat our body uh, like machines. And we mm -hmm. numb out from our physical sensations. We don't notice when our body says no. Mm -hmm. We live in an economic system that has us in a constant state of striving and in a constant state of feeling like we don't have enough. And mm -hmm. those two things on a nervous system level keep us very dysregulated and on guard and on edge. And over time, that can really impact our predisposition for illness, mental, mm -hmm. physical illness yeah oh that hit home yeah good <laughs> <laughs> huh i've got to chew on that a bit but I, i've seen it expressed in um so much like i am a bit of a veteran of the uh wellness and quote fitness world and i've i mean i don't brand myself as being in fitness anymore but mm -hmm. um being in my almost 45 <laughs> Um, I've earned my stripes in being able to be uh, cynical over the about some of the mainstream con concepts around health that really stop people from enjoying um, their lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, shoot. That's fascinating. Even the way we, we define resilience is so... Um, lacks in diversity as well, right? Hmm. How so? Well, the, what, like what does, type does of... Resilience what, kind of manifests differently for different people? That's right. Like the kind of resilience, what would be resilience for me would be maybe not be exactly the same as resilience for you. Uh, um, yeah. And it doesn't factor in that... Um, we, even if we want to feel stronger, more resilient, that it's not, not all up to us. It's not based on our own personal desire. <laughs> There's other factors from a biopsychosocial lens that impact different people's access to physical resiliency. That people who are really strong movers, people who um, don't, are, are living with intersectionality that predispose us like i'm a, a somewhat educated white woman that's going to predispose me to having access to more resilience in some people because mm. right just the cultural context you're in kind of yeah 
and I feel like what's yeah yeah, um so I just feel like sometimes what makes movement inaccessible to people um is that we aren't really working with a deeper understanding of what is truly possible for some people Mm. and and um how to make that more accessible for people I think um it behooves us those of us who've had more advantages to really break things down sometimes in a way that's very accessible. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And play is such a huge circling back to the play part. It's like for people who I've worked with populations of people who have, um, who've come out of war, who've experienced torture, who um, have never been encouraged to be live in an embodied way. Um, have never had agency over their own bodies, like women coming from cultures where they've been very, um, uh, I don't know what to say. And what's, ex- what's available for them is so different. And, and I think it behooves us to somehow break down um, embodiment in a way that is uh, factors in other populations. Mm. Mm. Yeah, oh, that's phenomenal. Yeah. I, so I was talking to, to Chris Steele or on like the very first episode of this and, and towards the very end of the conversation, he just dropped the little bomb. Like, yeah, privilege is when you get to choose when you want to be uncomfortable more or less. And, oh, that's you know, brilliant. Oh my yeah, gosh. he said that and I was like, well, I, yeah, I don't have anything else to say. That's, that's enough for me to think about for a long time to come. And I, one of the things I I most admire about what you're doing is uh, I know you've got like this rich background working with like a huge diversity of of different populations and and particularly people who are lacking a lot in terms of probably their, their available resources in terms of getting into embodiment work and and Mm -hmm. movement work and all of this. And uh, one of the things I've been puzzling over is how to, how to improve accessibility to a lot of this work that that we know is so vital for, for growth and development of of like the, just our our human capacity. Mm -hmm. I mean, based on, on your view of things and and everything you've experienced so far, like what are some of the tools that, that we can bring in as practitioners to, to improve accessibility to some of these things? I think it's, um, I think there's a real skill in packaging really complex information into uh, really uh, uh, experiences that can be integrated that make people want to repeat it on their own. Uh, And so when we've um, like, for example, with the population I've taught at the center for victims of torture, I would bring in, um, massage balls and not uh, as a way to break up tissue, more Mm -hmm. nervous system regulation and self-soothing. And um, what I'm trying to offer them instead of you need to build your core and you need to, (laughs) (laughs) that's the last thing on their mind, right? Mm -hmm. I'm like, how can you use this really simple tool at home to calm your nervous system before you go to bed and Mm -hmm. down regulate your pain receptors? Mm -hmm. Two super, super simple things that are absolutely not going to improve their overall movement um, vocabulary, but Mm -hmm. are exactly what they need at that point in time. So we have to, I think what I found uh, over the years is accepting that there isn't, that the way that we make things accessible for people is just grabbing the low hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And being able to really appreciate the limitations of what people can integrate instead of trying to shove it down their throat in a really prescriptive way. And it's, for me, it's always about how can I find somebody's pull? Mm. Cause I mean, in Canada, I think like less than 30% of the population gets enough movement to um, sustain health, much Mm -hmm. less improve. So for me, I'm like, what is going to pull people into wanting to move more? Mm -hmm. What is going to pull people into wanting to feel more embodied? Well, a lot of the time it's play, pleasure, and Mm self-soothing. And so I think we have to uh, 
have some humility and understanding that it's okay for people to do just what's within their bandwidth at any given point in time yeah. and not and not at all carry around that sense of urgency of wanting to convince people to do more than they can do right now. Hmm. Does that make sense at all? Oh, totally. Yeah. 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 And I mean, like I've worked with lots of people. I've worked with a lot of professors over the years um, because I, my old studio is close to U of T, University of Toronto. And um, helping someone who's never felt embodied move meant giving up the idea of an ideal program. Mm. Mm-hmm. Cause I wanted them to want to come back. So it's sort of like I bribe people in session. <laughs> <laughs> right as mm-hmm. soon as i notice that they have lost their desire to be in the room mm-hmm. and it starts feeling too much like work because most people i see work already so much oh yeah so when they're coming to see me i don't want to be in another addition to what feels like work for them mm-hmm. so helping people who aren't really experienced movers who've never felt really good in their body or even wanting to connect with their body that is not about learning how to do a perfect headstand, right? Mm -hmm. Certainly that's a personal practice, but there's an art to coaching people who really need it the most. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't want to spend time there because it's not really fancy stuff. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Probably doesn't make for great videos of like, this is my client (laughs) session and da, da, da. Yeah, but. No, no. uh, but that's probably the most nourishing thing you can do for whether we like it or not, the vast majority of people that we'll ever come into contact with. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh. oh, that's crazy. Was there, was there a time in, in your kind of professional life where like it just like clicked like, Oh, something's broken about the way that, that I've been working or that we are in general working. Like, was there a a kind of inciting incident around that? Yeah, I think it was when I was almost broken. (laughs) Ah, yeah. I opened up my new, I opened up a studio in 2006. I had a book come out that year. And don't look it up. I hate that book. And then, uh, (laughs) I don't hate it. It's just, I would never, ever write it or sell it again. Um, (laughs) Um. So I was super busy with that. And then about four months after I opened my studio, my daughter's father and I split up. Mm. And I'd been like really using exercise to numb out. You know, I was really pushing my body. I even was on like a hypertrophy program at that point. And like, good luck with me building any muscle because I'm like, oh, I got to go on TV for book interviews and stuff. I need to feel like I look like I'm fit. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then it all sort of, I lost my capacity to push and I had this really nice quiet studio and I just literally was so stressed. I felt like I was going to barf all day for about six months. And I was like, okay, I need to know, I know I need to move, but I, I can't do it like yeah. that anymore. Um, I just lost the capacity to, to push myself that way. So at that point, I also started noticing because I was in a private space, people who were living with cancer or out of cancer treatment started coming in. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm like, how can I help people have moments of vitality and feeling okay, given that they can't push their bodies that same, that same way. And then at that point, like I specialized in people who are going through cancer treatment or out of treatment. And then I just started really drawing a lot of connections between feeling overwhelmed. Like I had in my body, I was a bit more compassionate, I hope towards people because of feeling that level of, of um, like brokenness or fatigue. And I just did the studio just started becoming a place where I welcomed people with so many different health conditions or mental health um, challenges or trauma. And that's what was like, oh, okay, there we are. Mm. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That, that makes sense. 
Yeah. And it's been a journey. Like I, um, I get bored with the same movements over and over again because I've mm-hmm. been doing sets and reps and blah, 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 for so long. And I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to find my way into being involved with movement that makes me feel more resilient, but isn't and like, respecting that there's a certain amount of hygiene exercises we have to do. Mm-hmm. But what's interesting to me now is it's, I can't just, I, I need something that's more interesting. Riding, definitely riding a horse is the most complex mm. movement activity I've ever done. Um, I could do that every day and be really happy yeah. <laughs> with that. Yeah. Um, but it's always like, well, what's interesting to me now? What engages my brain? What uh, what makes me really want to work at mastering this as well? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's, you know, I was talking to a... a a new client yesterday and you know in our very first session she said something about like you know i'd love to be able to like climb a tree and i was like well say no more like if that's what's juicy then it does and she had, she then asked like well what came up in the assessment i was like well that stuff doesn't matter i mean it matters kind of but like not if you're like as you said like pulled towards something like let's go with what your entire being is pulled toward and we exactly. can fit in some of the other stuff if need be, but like, you know, maybe it's like the humanist in me, but it's like, man, if you're, if you're being pulled towards something, there's probably a good self-regulating reason why. Like there's a, totally. a wisdom inherent to ourselves that I feel like a lot of people are just kind of out of touch with. And they think like, the things I'm interested in can't be good for me too, right? Like that would be too <laughs> much to ask for. Or the things that are fun. Can't yeah. Be good for me. Yeah. Like, I love it when I hear about clients starting to dance, take take dance lessons, dance at home, like all that mm-hmm. stuff, and they're like, "That can't count." I'm like, "Yeah." It totally can. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's funny. I was playing some African drum, uh, drumming in a boundaries workshop, embodied boundaries workshop I was doing on Saturday, mm-hmm. and um. I'm so obsessed with music. Like music is such a, a huge part of my life. It's a huge resource, even for my daughter. Like I'm like, you have to fall in love with music while you're a teenager. It's going to make your life a lot better. Mm-hmm. And so music, all sorts of music, such a resource. And uh, I was playing some African drumming and just getting people to shake and like start accessing power in their body again and yeah. and um that's something I really bring into my work for people if they're interested or even introducing people to how music impacts how they feel and move and mm-hmm. what their body feels pulled to do is huge and I'm speaking at a I'm keynoting at a super weird conf, interesting conference in June um on faith and uh music and uh faith music and uh oh god and embodiment oh, okay and huh. it's uh yeah so i'm basically showing people what happens to your nervous system when we're in community with one another and uh and when music comes on and how we are much more able to connect with other people when we are feeling in rhythm with each other so anyway Oh, I could cool. go on about that. Yeah, it's really neat. So I, I'm basically telling uh, theologians why it's good on a neurobiological level. <laughs> That's awesome. I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very cool. Yeah. No, I'm also curious because I know you've got another one coming up soon, but the, the embodied boundaries kind of idea. What's mm. What's that all about for people that might not have an idea of what Boundaries right. What are. the hell is that about? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, what am I teaching? <laughs> kind of pulling it out of my own butt. But um, <laughs> I use my own like body as my research tool and my mm-hmm. own experience. But um, a lot of us, like Brené Brown, has great stuff about boundaries. Melody Beattie has great stuff about boundaries. We know we need healthy boundaries in relationships, and mm-hmm. uh, we know it in our heads but there's this block in being able to um, take better care of ourselves in relationships Mm. to notice that there's been a need to set a healthier boundary 
in all sorts of relationships from our kids right up into like people we don't want to be around who we feel unsafe around. Right. Mm -hmm. It's a full spectrum. So, and also the boundaries of what leaks out of us. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. we have this amazing walkie talkie system in our body called the vagus nerve and the enteric nervous system. Mm -hmm. But most of us aren't using that in our day to day life, the way we move through the world and we sense into um, information that our body is trying to send to us about different people in different situations and circumstances. So for me, like the cognitive piece, most people I work with already know what they need to be doing for themselves better. Mm -hmm. They already know where they're stuck, but then there's that missing piece. And that's the, the working with the nervous system element of helping people feel safer setting boundaries with people and so i basically help people resource a greater sense of power but from a very calm and regulated state learn how to take up space in a way that doesn't make people feel overwhelmed because playing small and playing nice is a very adaptive mechanism for a lot of people especially when we've lived in power imbalances or we've lived in homes where we had to kind of duck a lot and stay out of danger by you know, yeah, yeah, dodging or walking on eggshells. And so a lot of people feel a lot of shame because in our heads, cognitively, we know we need to be doing something, but we can't, we can't take that next step. Mm -hmm. And so feeling safe and powerful in our own bodies and learning, like from a very like meditative practice state of how to take up space and really install that in our system, our whole organism, Mm -hmm. it helps us feel safer and more confident um, in potentially upsetting people or destabilizing things or living with the guilt that comes up afterwards, all that stuff. It's like, and so I have a series of different exercises and movements and meditations that um, are meant to help people safely feel a bit of their own power again and Mm -hmm. dignity and their right to um decide what feels okay and not okay to them yeah very cool yeah yeah i've been i've been thinking about that more and more lately i you know over the i guess it was last summer maybe i read it was like a textbook around systems theory just because what the hell else do you do over summer and (laughs) it was really fascinating well yeah uh (laughs) a little bit of that too but it was really interesting looking at you know they were trying to define life in general characteristics. And one of like the key things that that they just thought might be a good thing to define life as, is that it sustains itself. Like it, it is able to discriminate between self and other and mediate those boundaries and, and absorb some things and reject other things. And it's like, Oh yeah, we're living things too. And, establishing boundaries like this in an embodied sense in a a social sense as well it's like it's not just like food you're eating it's interpersonal relationships that might be forced on you and that that's like an old psychotherapeutic idea too like introjecting something and just kind of swallowing someone else's idea whole and then confusing it for your own but having almost an, an immune response to it right like I almost died. I almost died actually when I was 26. I had this super rare autoimmune disease. Um, and it was way before there was a lot of discussion about the neurobiology of trauma. Mm. But my body was just like, I, am I allowed to swear on here? Totally. Swear away. <laughs> my body was like, fuck you. We're done. Yeah. And so I had zero platelets in my blood. Um, I, my brain could have bled like it was just such an acute autoimmune response sure. and uh um that i that's one of the ways i got really interested in um the impact of trauma and childhood trauma and neglect because it was like su- it was such a rare disease and it came out of nowhere um mm. and so i don't know why i was talking about that <laughs> Well, that, um, that, let's talk about that. Yeah, but, <laughs> but what I'm saying is it does like when we don't, when we don't have a sense of uh, containment and separateness and we start to um, 
absorb things without feeling like we have a right to keep things out. Um, mm. I really do think our body starts to uh, just get completely overwhelmed and, and, uh, and start to attack itself because it's just not a sustainable way of living. Yeah. Oh, that's big. I've, you know, I've had a couple of clients that I've worked with over the years who had maybe not similar. It doesn't sound like it was at that level, but I mean, autoimmune kind of issues that came up around like various different personal or traumatic kind of events in their lives. And it's like, mm -hmm. damn, how are we not talking about this in like a, a broader scale? Like that's, that's massive. And I mean, there, there's starting to be some work in terms of like psychoneuroimmunology so we can get like the empirical evidence behind it so that maybe we can talk well, about know, it with confidence. Let's back, back up to the adverse childhood experiences study. Mm -hmm. Oprah, Oprah did an interview on CBS, I think it was last month. And everybody thinks, and it links basically uh, adverse childhood experiences um, to an increased risk for a number of different diseases, including autoimmune disease, mental health mm. conditions, cancer. Do you know when that study came out? I'm trying to think. It's, it's old. I've heard of it a couple yeah. of times, but it's, it's yeah. a long... It's like 20 years old. Knowledge transfer takes so long. The huh. evidence is already there. The research is there. Um, and it followed research, but knowledge transfer takes so long. Um, and I mean, there's a great book, uh, Childhood Dis Disrupted, which you might find interesting. Oh, okay. Um, our biology become our biography becomes our biology, and it's all it's mm. a amazing solid research, uh, especially for women, linking a number of different health uh, predisposition for health conditions. Um, mm -hmm. So the research is there. It's just not being extrapolated into our healthcare systems and um, physical and mental health care systems yet. Mm -hmm. And I think personally, I think part of the bias is towards the brain chemistry, brain disease model of mm -hmm. mental, mental health that um, is slow to die. Yeah. Cause it's, it's a much, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I could go on that tangent, but I won't. Mm, yeah. That's a nice, <laughs> I mean, that's probably comfortable for the Cartesian rift of things to say like, well, yeah, it's just brain chemistry. That's all there is to it. Yeah. Why would mental health have like a social construct component as well? That would be crazy <laughs> to think about. That'd be crazy now. <laughs> uh, yeah. Wow. Lots to talk about, hey? Mm hmm Yeah. Yeah. So what else? What else is juicy else? for you these days? Juicy, juicy. Huh. I would say that's how coming up. Uh, I just learned so much again with the riding, um, mm -hmm. with riding on a horse. Like I, I've learned so much about myself and, uh, and how to be in relationship and how to read nervous system stuff and how mm -hmm. to regulate my own nervous system. Um, because what I notice with a lot of people, I can get them to think about doing an intense activity. And I'm like, okay, tell me if you've got a belly zap, I call them belly zaps, like activation. Mm. And um, I'm just so fascinated in even thinking about um, a more intense physical activity, how that impacts our nervous system before we're even doing it. Mm. And how we can learn how to regulate our own nervous system before we go and try to do something hard so that we stay in a state of being a lot more centered and calm and regulated because I can be riding um, and I ride incredible horses. So I'm not sure all horses are like this, but we'll be thinking of doing say canter um, or even jumping. Mm -hmm. And my teach, my coach will be like, okay, slow your body down because if I think canter, the horse will start cantering. Oh, that's so weird. It's so amazing, <laughs> right? Yeah. Amazing. And I think about that when we're with clients because if, if we are ultimately co-regulators when mm. we're with our clients and our own nervous system stuff is what people get to piggyback on when they start to feel that activation in their nervous system, which is going to interfere with their ability to stay present in the movement or with their own body. 
Mm-hmm. And so um, I think what we're missing during movement, um, we call movement mindful. But to me, movement is only, quote, mindful when it has something called dual awareness in it. Um, and Babette Rothschild is a remarkable uh, trauma therapist. She uses this from a trauma therapy, per- therapy perspective. But from a nervous system regulation perspective, I use this. I have to be so regulated in my own body and aware of what I'm feeling on the inside in order for me and the horse to accomplish something really challenging Mm -hmm. and for, for the horse to be really balanced and not falling forward on its legs in kind of a panic state. And um, there's so many movers I've worked with. um, I've almost do like professional dancer rehab. (laughs) or um, gymnast rehab because so much of our movement doesn't involve dual awareness where not only are we thinking about how to accomplish this movement on the inside but we're not also rooting our awareness on say interoception inner body awareness at the same time and so people focus on a movement but they're not really in the movement yeah And um, I really see that as such an important element of the positive neuroplasticity benefits of movement in the long term Mm -hmm. um, for my clients as well. And uh, what really re-embodiment means. It's not about moving well, that's part of it, but it's also how am I truly with myself as I'm doing this? Mm -hmm. And and that plays out in coaching when we're with people too. Like how can yeah. we really be in our own bodies and bring our bodies with us when we're with our clients? Right? Mm. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's like, you've got to be pretty damn rooted in yourself if you want to facilitate someone else going through. And also how do you notice what's going on in someone else's body and nervous system? If you don't know how to read your own internal walkie talkie system. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. When you're with somebody, because I get, I gather information all the time because I work with a lot of people who are or go into dissociation. So Mm -hmm. they leave their bodies and then I feel what they're not feeling. (laughs) (laughs) Right. And then I kind of get that information and then I can kind of coach them into whatever we need to do next. Mm -hmm. But with this whole re like embodiment movement, I'm like, well, are you in your body when you're moving? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Are you in your body when you're teaching? Like so many yoga teachers aren't scanning their own bodies and bringing their mm-hmm. own bodies um, with them. And we yeah. live in this sort of compartmentalized, this is the time I'm going to pay attention to my body in my day. And then the rest of the time is like whatever. And then I'm going to spend this time meditating at the end of the day. I'm like, well, whoa, 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 whoa. What about all the time? <laughs> what, what happened in that the- interim? Yeah. 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 Hmm. Yeah, that's really cool. I like that. Well, so let me ask you, I know you're, you're busy and you've got a ton of stuff going on, but where, where do people find you? How do they, how do people who are interested in this, which hopefully is everybody's shit, but how do they yeah. like, get <laughs> deeper down your rabbit hole in particular? Like what's mm. the rabbit hole? Someone called me a client yesterday, called me kooky clap. <laughs> <laughs> kooky clap. I'm like, I had her playing with Play-Doh because she's super dysregulated. Play-Doh mm. in one hand, balancing something in another hand. I'm like, shit, I got to help you get regulated. She's like, well, what am I doing? I'm like, it's working, isn't it? She's it's like, working, You're... whatever it is, yeah. Um, so you can find me at Jane Clap with two Ps, mm-hmm. janeclap.com. And there is a huge section with tons of podcasts and interviews and articles um, under Watch and Read if you want to start just kind of seeing what I'm talking about. And then um, on Instagram, my handle, <laughs> I didn't, I would have gone with just Jane Clapp, but Jane the Clapp. And we know that double entendre and it's just fine. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and then <laughs> whatever. And then same Twitter sort of meant, I mm-hmm. don't really love Twitter. And then uh, Facebook, I have a bit more like articles and other information. I'm researching Jane Clapp body intelligence for trauma and mental health. Nice. And that's where you can find me. And then hopefully something is of interest to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very yeah. cool. Huh. 
Well, Jane, thank you. This has been, I, I want to keep this conversation going because I've just got like just a lot to digest, but. Uh, it's been such a pleasure. I, I feel yeah. like I could talk to you all day. Really. You're, I, we I should set know. up an all day thing. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know, but like now I'm left being like, I want to know more about you. I talked all about myself, but there's so many little nuggets you dropped in there that I'm like, oh, it's too bad you're so far away. <laughs> Toronto road trip, I suppose. Yay. Yeah, that'd be awesome. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs>